everyone, my name is Paige and today we're going to be talking about burns. Burns can be, burns are injuries to your skin that can be caused by either a thermal burn from dry heat like a fire flame or from moist heat like from boiling water. You can also get a chemical burn which is from drain cleaners, gasoline, or paint thinners. You can also get a radiation burn from the sun or from chemotherapy. You can also get an electrical burn from direct contact with an electrical source or from lightning. So we know how the burn affects our skin. We first, let's talk about the layers of our skin. The outermost layer of our skin is called the epidermis and it is our first line of defense in our immunity. Our middle layer of our skin is called the dermis. The middle layer contains our blood vessels, hair follicles, nerve endings, and sweat glands. Then our deepest layer is called the subcutaneous layer. It's below the, the dermis. It contains larger blood vessels, nerves, fat for installation, and it helps to regulate our body temperature. Burns are based on the depth and the extent of the burn. Risk factors for burns are children under four years old due to their curiosity with lighters, stoves, and matches, older patients due to their slower reflexes, dementia, and thinning skin. Persons with lower socioeconomic uh, status are also at risk due to unsafe homes or maybe they have no smoke detectors. People who smoke, vape, and drink alcohol are also at increased risk. Persons with physical or mental disabilities are at higher risk. Persons who work with chemicals or electricity are at higher risk. Number one way to prevent burns in the home is to make sure you have a smoke detector in each room of your home. Also, when you're cooking at home, make sure you have a fire extinguisher handy. Home safety for children is very important. Make sure you lock up your cabinets that have lighters or the chemicals for cleaning at home. Water heaters in the home should be set between 120 to 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Smokers, make sure they put their cigarettes out 100% and make sure they don't smoke if they are tired. Superficial burns only affect the epidermis, which is our outer layer of our skin, and is caused by uh, the sun or cancer radiation therapy. It heals within three to six days. It is mildly painful and only needs a mild analgesic and a water-soluble lotion to heal. If you look up here, I have a diagram of the burn, of a superficial burn, and here are the layers of the skin. The outermost layer of the skin is our epidermis, and which is affected, and then here's the dermis, and here's our lower layer of the subcutaneous layer of our skin. The superficial part, partial thickness burns affects the epidermis and the dermis only in the upper papillary layer of the dermis though. Due to a flash flame, dilute chemicals, hot surfaces, they look bright red, moist, clear blisters, and blanches on pressure, more painful than a first degree burn. It heals within 21 days, slight or no scarring, but, but pigment changes are common. They will also need an analgesic for pain. And here's our picture of our partial thickness burn, and it affects our super, our epidermis, and our dermis into the papillary layer. Our deep partial thickness burns include our epidermis and dermis into the lower reticular layer of the dermis. So it's deeper than the superficial partial thickness burn. See how it goes deeper here into the skin? And it is caused by hot solids or liquids, direct flame, and chemical agents. They look pale yellow, white, or dry. They can have blisters that are either bustable or flat and dry. Less painful due to the sensation damage. It takes more than 21 days to heal, and they may go to a full thickness burn if necrosis extends deeper. May need excision or skin graft and can develop a contracture. A full thickness burn is in our last picture here, and it involves our epidermis, our dermis, and our subcutaneous layer of our skin. And it is caused by long contact with flames, steam, or high voltages. And they look waxy, white, to leathery, molted, charred. They are non-blanching, firm, stiff to the touch. 
Pain only to pressure due to damage to the pain and nerve receptors. Requires a skin graft, knee topical agents, excisions, and possible amputation if they can't restore circulation to that area. Um, with burns, there's phases with burns. There's an emergent phase, which is the first 24 to 72 hours of the burn. The goal is fluid resuscitation and ABCs. Over here is a description of a fluid resuscitation model. They use the rule of nines, and to do the fluid resuscitation um, math on it, you will need the patient's weight in kilograms and percent of the body burn. To figure out the percent of the body burn, I drew a, I drew a little guy here, or woman, and um, the head, this is all based on percents. The head is 9%. The arms, the front of the arms are 4.5. The back of the arm is 4.5. That equals 9. The upper layer of the chest is 9. The um, abdomen is 9. And on the back, the top upper part of your back, posterior upper part of your back is 9. And the lower part of your back is 9. And you also have your legs because they're bigger than your arms. They're 9 in the front and they're nine in the back. And your privates, if they're burnt, they're 1%. This model here is saying for all these areas, there's 11 areas of the nines, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, 11. And 11 areas times nine equals 99, and your 1% for your genitalia gives you 100%. This would be a good picture to draw for your test so you know if they give you a patient, what areas are burned, you can figure out what percent it is, and that way you can do your um, math on the fluid resuscitation. Parkland, their model for fluid resuscitation is four mLs of lactated ringers times um, the body surface area that's been burnt based on these percentages here, times the patient's um, kilograms, their weight in kilograms. And that gives you the volume of lactated ringers. Now, this patient, once you find out what their volume is, in the first eight hours, they'll get 50%. And over the next 16 hours, they'll get the other 50% of that fluid for resuscitation. So, and then after we get the uh, fluid resuscitation, burn victims are, they're always at risk for, because um, the fluid shifting from the vascular space into the interstitial space, into your tissues, these patients are at risk for, um, they're going to be uh, hypovolemic, and um, they're, they're always at risk, so they're going to have risk for cardiac, but they're also going to have risk for breathing, especially if they have any type of uh, smoke inhalation or, or any kind of burns around their mouth that cause swelling and they can get choked and everything else. So you always want to check their ABCs, their airway, breathing, and circulation. So the next phase is the acute and it starts with when the patient actually starts urinating because if we properly fluid resuscitate them, they will start um, diuresing. And it ends with closure of the wound. Now in the rehabilitation phase of the burns, we, uh, the burns are covered and the patient is at their new functional best. So um, with patients, um, I did a... These are not all the assessment, diagnosis, and interventions for a burn patient. I'm just giving you a few here. I'll also attach a PowerPoint. We'll have more um, elaborate, extensive um, information because I can't go all over all of that here. But when you want to do an assessment on a patient, at first you want to assess the burn. Um, you know, you want to see the extent of it so you know how to do your fluid resuscitation, what you're dealing with. And sometimes they even have to be transported to a burn center if they're too bad. Um, you want to assess their respirations like we talked about early. You also want to assess their fluid needs. Um, diagnose the patient. You want to see, check their oxygen levels, their ABGs to see how well um, their acid base balance with their, um, their lungs, see how well their lungs are functioning. See if they've had any kind of dealings with um, carbon oxyhemoglobin to see if they've been in um, anywhere where they've been near, near um, carbon monoxide. Uh, EKG due to um, when the patients burn and their cells are burned, the cells lice 
it releases hyperkalemia, well, kalemia, it causes hyperkalemia, and of course, uh, potassium can mess up your heart and cause arrhythmias. So you want to put them on an EKG to make sure everything's okay. And of course, do a urinalysis on them and to see how their uh, renal function is. Some of the interventions is, first you want to stop the burning, if they have burning, stop the burning, remove whatever's burning them. Sometimes you might have to remove clothing if it has any kind of chemicals on it or anything like that. Um, these patients will need um, oxygen, so they always uh, recommend 100% non-rebreather mask on uh, burn victims. Uh, you want to check urine, you want to check what you're putting in on, make sure it's coming out with these patients because they are fluid resuscitated. Um, you want to check their vital signs and also that goes into then perfusion, check their blood pressure, um, obviously check their pulse ox and you know do sterile dressing changes on these patients to make sure we don't put them at any kind of risk for infection. So these patients also with our interventions, uh, they might also need an excarotomy, and that's when you remove the dead tissue so that area can get um, proper blood fusion, perfusion to that area. They also might need a fasciotomy if it goes too deep into the muscle to um, release it to make sure they're getting perfused to that area. Uh, they might need skin grafts uh, to help to cover that wound and so the patient can grow their own skin back. Uh, sometimes if you can't if you can't get that area perfused sometimes these patients need um, amputation due to poor circulation and if you want to evaluate a patient from a burn uh, the evaluation hopefully they'll be in uh, free of infections the patient have stable respiration stable fluid uh, volume within normal limits and of course let's hope they adjust to change because this does take a, a psychological effect on patients uh, it's going to affect skin, you know, that's part of your appearance, so they can affect them psychologically. I mean, sometimes they might have a disability due to it, and, you know, now they might have to get another job or they can't work anymore, so it just, it just depends. Um, if patient's going home in a wound, you know, it might be covered over and, and, and healing and everything else, and during the, the rehabilitation stage, they might go home and, you know, they're still caring for this wound, so you want to teach the patient Make sure they keep the burn clean. Report any signs of infection like fever, any exudate, um, more pain, pains return, more pain, like any kind of signs of infection. That way, you know, it can be treated and the patient can be cared for. You also want to teach these patients to do um, range of motion on that area. Say you burned your arm, when skin heals, it gets taut. You know, and, and range of motion and physical therapists and everything else to get with them and make sure they're, sometimes they need to be splints so they don't get contractures and stuff like that. Uh, like I said earlier, you want to teach the patient psychologically, how are they doing? Um, do they need to see somebody? You know, just check their mental health also. Just, you know, make sure they have the resources they need in case they do need to speak to somebody. Um, uh, you're going to collaborate with everybody with a burn victim because, I mean, this it's such a systemic effect on everything. But um, I picked the um, palmologist, and that way, he, in case the patient needs to be intubated, any kind of any kind of facial burns can cause swelling in the neck, and uh, they might need to be intubated to protect their airway to make sure these pa pa patients can breathe. I also picked the cardiologist due to the, um, the EKG, uh, just in case the hyperkalemia and due to the fluid shift, just to keep an eye on them. Uh, but you, the patient will need to collaborate with everybody. I mean, I picked the heart and respiratory, but they will also need to see neurovascular, GI, urinary system, immune system, uh, dietary for the metabolism, uh, musculoskeletal people, skin uh, uh, people, and, and like I said, mental health. And I've also attached um, an Excel sheet that will go into in deeper depth about how burns affect these systems here. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about um, carbon monoxide. I know I brought it up over here to check them, but they can be from carbon monoxide poisoning. They can breathe in um, this from a external fuel leak, uh, tobacco smoke, vehicle exhaust, a faulty water heater. 
And the problem with carbon monoxide is it, it's odorless and tasteless, so, you know, you don't even know. So, and it has a 200 times affinity for hemoglobin than oxygen. So, these people need to be treated and seen quickly. Also, cyanide, um, inhaling that, and you can inhale that from burning wool, silk, nylon, or plastics. And uh, high, amounts, high amounts of breathing in cyanide can kill within minutes. So, just something to be aware of. Um, the article I picked for burns is because when I was doing my research, I was on, um, what was it, ameriburn.org. And um, I was on there, and it, and it pulled up people being burnt from vapors, electronic cigarettes. So I picked my topic based on that because I was like, I didn't even know people were getting burnt from that. So when I pulled up my, um, I looked up two articles on it, and um, they're getting burned from the vapors. Most of them have the vape in their pocket. They're not carrying it in their case. And the lithium uh, batteries are at higher risk for a thermal explosion. So these patients are getting burned by their um, electronic cigarettes. And so, you know, the, the main thing I took away from um, the article I read on vaping and, and burns from them is teaching. You know, I mean, you never see an ad where it says, you know, keep your vape, in, you know, in its case or, you know, how to, you know, the care in, of the vape and, you know, what to do with the battery, you know. I mean, you need to, they need to store, really just need teaching on Either keep the vape and the the battery separate, or keep the vape in its proper carrying case to avoid burns to their skin. So um, that's all I have today, and thank you for your time.